Good morning, Midway family. How are you, Wit? Hey, Kimberly, I'm great. <laughs> welcome, welcome online, welcome in the house. Happy Easter to you. We are so, so, so excited that you're here. Happy Easter, guys. We've already said names, but like we should introduce ourselves. Yes. Hi, guys. I'm Kimberly Mosley. I am the social media coordinator here. And I'm Wit Maxi. I'm the communication pastor, and I'm the one not dressed in orange. Yeah, um, you know, they saw me and they were like, oh, Kimberly, do you need your security lanyard today? Because I clearly look like I'm directing traffic. <laughs> and, <laughs> but no, I was like, no, I'm going to be in the broadcast room. So, you know. <laughs> well, look, most of our traffic cones are, in fact, highlighter yellow. So That's I think true. the orange is just a solid choice. Yeah, just you know. Just for happy Easter fits. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I did my hair last week. I've been joking about it. I did my hair, touched up the copper, and uh, it turned out very vibrant. Um, and I had already ordered this. So we really committed to the bit. I love it. I Am mean, I a listen. carrot? Am I a traffic cone? I don't know. <laughs> Any and all suggestions should go in the comments. Please she... be gentle with me, though. I'll cry. <laughs> <laughs> listen, uh, all, all fun and games here yes. as we celebrate our fifth Easter service of the week. We've had a great week so far. We had a service on Wednesday night. We had one last night. Uh, and we've already had two this morning, and I can tell you this, you are in for a great, great a morning great if you're here with morning. us. Um, Pastor Kevin is here to bring the word. He's going to be con continuing to talk about the reach, but this week, it's all about the reach God has for each of us, and that's pretty special. Um, yes, absolutely. And the, the worship is awesome. I hope you guys will um, really get get into it and yeah. have fun and, you know. Sing loud. Sing loud. Wherever you are. Raise your hands if, if you like doing that even. kind of thing. Yeah. If you're in public on your phone watching this with headphones on, like, no reason to not sing out loud. Sure. Just, yeah, it's okay if people see if you If you want to have somebody record that and then send it to me, uh, Kimberly <laughs> Mosley right. at midwaychurch.com so we can just, share just that. Just tag us in that post. Content, That'd be awesome. right? Right. It's all good. <laughs> it's great. Well, guys, um, I want to ask Wit, what, what are some of your Easter traditions that you've grown up doing Easter traditions okay so for us we did egg hunts we did the, the typical thing you do and I remember yeah. uh very specifically the first time I found the golden egg at our house which was Ooh. the one that was filled with the dollar bill nice. instead of the candy that was a big deal a big deal and I remember like we had had like kind of kind of a backyard that we my dad had built like a little yeah. playground set for us and it was hidden right above the swing and I found it my brother was very upset because I found the dollar bill egg mm. that was a big deal um yeah. you know candy the like you know I I'm a jelly bean guy so I okay. love a good jelly bean um, love good chocolate stuff, but that's kind of what we did. But you know, for uh, for us, it was always go to church, okay. dress up. You know, we always put the clip on tie when you're five nice, or six nice. and you don't know how to tie a real one. Yeah. Uh, and then we come home and eat a Sunday roast. So we had okay. kind of a whole thing going. What about you? Nice. Um, so we would. Um my mom would always focus on making the holiday like as much about Jesus yeah. as possible. Right. So we actually did like the resurrection eggs, which yes. was fun. So we've done that with our daughter this year. So that's a really cool way to make it hands-on yep. and tangible. Um, and instead of a chocolate bunny, I got chocolate praying hands or a chocolate cross growing up. Okay, chocolate, yeah. chocolate. Yeah, I mean, I it's it's totally fine either way. And then we would do a thing where we would make resurrection rolls. Have you okay. heard of those? Only from you Only this morning. Only from me, yes. But for the so people out there that don't know what they are, you guys, fill us in. If you don't know about them, um, they are marshmallows dipped in butter. Delicious. Rolled in cinnamon sugar. Delicious. Encased in a crescent roll, and then you bake them in the oven, and the marshmallow melts, so they're called resurrection rolls or empty tomb rolls because the marshmallow... It's gone. Empty. It's gone. It's empty. Uh, 10 out of 10, I would eat 12. Yes, I'll like have today. to bring some to the office sometime, uh, for yeah. sure. I'm sure Even it would be delicious. Even if it's after Easter, I'm you sure know? it would be delicious. Yeah, of course. Well, um, so that's amazing. I mean, I, listen, shout out to your mom, though, for being yeah. a real one that really kept it about the season. Of I think obviously it's easy for us to get caught up in the fun, the outfits, the egg hunts, the chocolates, the, the pastries, all the yeah. things, right? But obviously we know why we're here. Uh, we know we're here to celebrate the risen Savior, Jesus, who is alive. The tomb is empty. He is yes. risen. And uh, can't wait to celebrate that this morning with our crowd. It's going to be great. Yeah. Well, and if you guys have any um, anything that you do for your family that we haven't talked about today, we'd love to hear yep. it in the comments. And we're so glad. If this is your first time at Midway, we're so happy to he that you guys are here or that you're joining us online. Um, and we'd love to get you more plugged in yeah. as well. So feel free to stop um, by the... What, what, it's not we got, the next we got starting room. point. Starting can, point. Yes. point where you can ask questions. If you're online, you can obviously just tag us on social posts, yeah. send us messages, DMs, all that. We're we're here for it. Um, you can also go to the Connect Desk and talk to people. Just fill out a Connect card. You can do that digitally. You can do that in the room. There's so many ways to get connected because that's what it's really all about. It's being here together as a family. We know life's hard, but it's harder. It's alone. harder alone. And yeah. so we want to be a community. We want to be a family. And the best way to celebrate Easter is by worshiping together right now with us here at Midway Church. Happy Easter, y'all.
It's Easter, He is risen. I was buried beneath my shame. That's right. Who could carry that kind away? It was my tomb. Yeah. It was my tomb. Come on, church, we sing. Midway Church, we're so glad that you're here with us today. If you're a first timer, thanks for being here. We're excited to celebrate with you online. Thank you guys for tuning in this morning. It's been a special time from Wednesday all the way to today. And we've seen so many baptisms over the course of this week and God's just been doing amazing things. And we celebrate him, we celebrate what today means, that he is risen and he's our hope for today. So thank you guys for being here. Um, as always, we wanna be a friendly church, so turn to somebody near you, make sure everyone has been smiled to. Let's go.
Good morning, Midway Church. 
Have a seat for just a minute. So glad you're here. For many of you who are guests, we're especially delighted that you're here today and celebrating this amazing occasion that happened in the history of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A couple of things I want to share with you if you're new to Midway to help you understand who we are and really tie those in to what this day is all about. We have a set of core values, 10 core values you'll find on our website at midwaychurch.com and they'll help you understand a little about who we are. Two of those core values I want to highlight right now. First one that I want to highlight is that every human matters. That means that you matter. Regardless of where you've been, what you've done or haven't done, or how you feel about yourself, God loves you. Secondly, not only does every human matter, but because every human matters, we choose to meet people where they are. And that really is the essence of God becoming flesh and dwelling among mankind in Jesus Christ because you couldn't come to where he was, so he came to you. And we try to carry that out in our own personal life and the way we live at Midway Church. So if you're a guest with us today, Please know that we believe you matter and we're here to meet you where you are. All of that is possible because he lives. One of my favorite songs growing up in church was a song called Because He Lives. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. We're gonna sing that in just a few minutes, but before we do, every week, right now, we're seeing people come to know Christ as personal Lord and Savior, surrendering their life to Jesus. And they follow Christ in believers' baptism. When they go under the water, it represents the death of Jesus. When they come out of the water, it represents the resurrection of Jesus, which we're celebrating here today. And they're saying to everyone here in this audience by following Christ in baptism, my faith to get to heaven and to be forgiven of my sin is all centered on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's possible because he lives. Pay attention to the baptistry here. Good morning, Midway. I'm Mackenzie, if we have not met, and I am up here with Lisa Wright, and we have our friend Kristen Murphy. If you're friends and family of Kristen, will you please stand? Take it away, Ms. Lisa. <laughs> First of all, I want to say to Kristen how blessed I am that you asked me to be a part of your baptism, and I love you. Kristen and I have been friends for about two and a half years now. Kristen helps me so much um, in our campus services ministry, and um, I'm just thankful for her that she's always willing to jump in. She's helped with Vacation Bible School. Um, I'm just very proud of her, how she serves um, here at Midway. Also, I want to say to you, that served last week at our D-Nail. Um, thank you, because Kristen accepted Christ last week at D-Nail. And um, so thank you to you, Kristen. <clears throat> I also want to say um, something to her uncle, Joey. Um, many of you know Joey Brown. Joey, is, he's been responsible for making sure that Kristen comes to church each week. And um, I've... He and I have prayed together many times for Kristen because he's been so concerned about her salvation. So I appreciate you, Joey, and the investment that you've made in Kristen's life. Thank you. Kristen, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes. yes. So with that, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
in my humanity and stubbornness, in motherhood, in my anxiety, in my grief, when I was searching for who I was. In my addiction. In my early parenting years. In my doubts. When my daughter was very sick. In my darkest moment. Through community. When I was still. In my worry. God reached for me. He 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 reached for me. Easter Midway. So good to see all of you. He reached for me. That's the message of Easter. Aren't you glad? It's true. We're so glad. I got good news for you today. He is risen. Yeah, give him some praise if that excites you like it does me today. We are so glad you are here. Hey, listen, whether you got one of the big giant eggs because somebody invited you or maybe they drug you here, you just showed up to get them off your back or you've been a part of Midway for a long time, you're tuning in online, you're in the house, whatever brought you here, friend, I know God's ready to reach you right where you are as well. And we're glad you're here. And we're excited to see you. So Midway Church, let's make our newest friends really welcome today. Let's tell them we're glad they're here. Yeah, if you're new with us, we consider you family. Welcome. Welcome. I want to talk to you today about the reach of the resurrection. The reach of the resurrection. If you got a Bible, uh, if you don't, we got them on the screen. The verses will be there. We're going to be in Luke chapter 24, if you want to find your way there. The reach of the resurrection. We've been talking as a church now for about three months about how God chooses to reach people where they are. It's one of our core values you heard about because every human matters. We choose to meet people where they are. That's not our idea. That's God's idea. God chose to reach people through his church. And today there is no greater reach than the resurrection. But the truth is, it may be a reach for you just to be here. <laughs> it may be a stretch for you to say, for me to believe that somebody died and literally rose from the dead, that's a stretch. That's a reach, Pastor. And if that's where you're at, I believe you're going to see God reach right where you're at in your doubts and in your questions and in your wrestlings to meet you there. And since we just met, I wanted to introduce to you part of my family. My wife is Jessica. We've been married 18 years. If we just met, we have three kids, 13-year-old Caleb, 11-year-old Callie, and then now six-year-old Kaya. But I want to show you a picture of Kaya when she wasn't even really walking well yet. Y'all say, oh, ain't she cute? I mean, she's, I love my kids. I love my kids so much. So I want to ask you a question, though. She's reaching up in this moment, reaching for her parents, reaching for her dad. What do you think I did in this moment as she reached for me? No, I, I knocked her over and said, get away from me, child. <laughs> of course I didn't do that. I reached down and I picked her little snuggly, squishy self up and just held her tight. And man, I just, I love my kids. I really just love my kids. But I'm going to tell you something. As much as I, as an earthly father, love Kaya and love my babies, I want you to think about this. My love for them is nothing compared to the love of the heavenly father for you. And that blows my mind. Why would God love somebody like me? 
Why would he choose to reach out to me? That's the challenge of Easter. He reached for me. So my challenge to you is, will you reach up for him? Let's take a lesson. Let's take a, a page out of the Kaya book today. And let's reach up to our Heavenly Father and just watch as he stretches out, reaches down to meet you where you are because that is who he is. I promise you, if you reach for him, he won't knock you over and say, get out of the way. He'll say, come to your Father. He'll meet you there. And that's one of the things that makes Christianity different from every other pathway of faith and religion in the world. I often get asked this question, what makes Christianity different? Don't all paths just lead to God? Well, all paths do lead to God in that we're all going to stand before a holy God one day. But all paths don't lead to eternal life as a part of God's family. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. What's so different about Jesus then? What's so different about Christianity? When I answer that question, I go to two things. The first one I just shared with you about when Kaya reaches up for me, her earthly father, and I pick her up, that's a, a, a picture of grace. I don't have to pick her up, but I want to pick her up. That's number one. It's grace. What sets Christianity apart? Grace. Every other path to God is ultimately a works-based path. Every other religion ultimately says, I have to measure up. God's standard is here, and I just got to be good enough to make the cut. Some of you feel so beaten down. Some of you feel like you'll never measure up. People have told you you'll never amount to anything. Your heavenly father sees you and says, I know what you've done. I know where you've been. And I still love you anyway. I'll still reach down and scoop you up anyway. We're saved by grace, through faith, not of works, or then we would boast about it. That sets Christianity apart. It makes it different. Now, I want to give you the second thing, and that's what we're going to talk about all day today, and that is resurrection. Resurrection makes Christianity different. Did you know today the founder of every other religion, the founder of any other pathway, supposed pathway to God, is either one commemorated currently in a tomb somewhere where people are making pilgrimages just to go visit where their body is buried or they're heading to a tomb somewhere, <laughs> except for Jesus. I, I took a group to Israel just this last summer, Pastor Todd and I and 40 of our closest friends and Jessica and Lisa, we had a great time in Israel and we walked to one of the places where it's believed to be the tomb of Jesus. And you know what I found in there? Nothing. Because he's alive, and because he lives, not only can I face tomorrow, but I have a tomorrow that I can look forward to today, and I know the end of the story. This story ends with grace, and this story ends with resurrection and eternal life because he lives. I can face tomorrow. Y'all give God some praise. Let me don't do it weak around here. That's right. If you believe it, then we stand on that today. Today is one of the biggest parties in all of the world's history. Did you know there's some 2.4 plus billion people who profess to be followers of Jesus and say, I'm a Christian today? In AD 33, when the Holy Spirit was launching the church, you know how many people pro profess to be Jesus followers? About 120. So how do we, out of 8 billion people, some almost a third of the world's population will be celebrating the resurrection on this very weekend? How did it go from 120 to 2.4 plus billion people? In a word, the resurrection. In a word, it's true. Jesus rose from the dead. So I say, let's read about it today. If you're ready for the word today, give somebody a fist bump or high five. Say, let's dig in. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 1. And I like that it's verse 1 because I believe today can be a verse 1 in your life. Do you know God's ready to turn over a new chapter in the pages of your story? And it can start today. Not because I'm here, not because you're at Midway Church in these buildings or you're watching online, but because Jesus will meet you where you are. I want to show you how he reaches us through today's message. Let's read about the resurrection. Verse 1, Luke 24 says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among 
the dead. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered. Circle that word. We're going to come back to it. We're going to live with that word for a little bit today. That the Son of Man, Jesus said, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. That's the story of the resurrection morning here. And I want to take you to that word delivered. Here it is in the Greek. The original language is paradidomai. Somebody say paradidomai. Y'all can use that at lunch. And you show, man, that Midway Church, they, they taught us some stuff. And even if you don't pronounce it right, they don't know anyway. Just act like you knew. Be confident. Paradidomai. Here's what it means. It literally means a handing over. It means that there's something that's mine that I'm handing over to you. And even this connotation of I'm handing this over for keeping for a season. Now, I know that doesn't make a lot of sense just yet, but you file that away for a few moments and you'll see that word come up again in verse 20 in a few moments. And then I want to show you how it actually plays a big role in the gospel in Jesus's journey to the cross. So file that away. Jesus said he must be delivered, handed over to sinful men to be crucified and on the third day rise. Now, here's what I know about humans. To us as humans, death seems really like a natural part of life. I know because you even drove by a cemetery as you came in and probably didn't think much about it. You drive by those, you see them all over the place. But I'm going to tell you, resurrection feels unnatural to us as humans. I can prove it to you. If you drove by the cemetery as you came in today and people started popping their head out of the ground and come to church with you, that'd be quite a resurrection Sunday. It'd feel quite a bit unnatural, right? I'm guessing you wouldn't be sitting here quite as attentive as you are right now. Resurrection feels unnatural, but our God does things in reverse. To God, death is unnatural. To God, resurrection is what's natural. To God, he is life. He didn't just bring life to death. Jesus is light. Jesus is life. He's the way. He's the truth. And he's the life. And we come to the Father through him, to God. Resurrection is what is natural. Resurrection, listen. Resurrection is not just something God did three days after he died on the cross. Resurrection is not just something God did. Resurrection is who God is. He is the life. He is the life you've been looking for. And I believe, listen, everything you've been looking for can be found in Jesus. And man, I could preach that all day. And, I, and y'all could clap and you could say amen. Amen. But I would be ignoring something I know about you. You say, well, you don't know me. You're right. But I do know two things about you. I do know that you're a human like me. And I do know that you still have breath in your lungs, at least for now. But you're not promised tomorrow. You're not even promised to make it to the end of the service. And if I go, well, y'all just finish the sermon. You know where I'm at. I'm going to be with Jesus, and that's fine with me. But I know right now you've got breath in your lungs. And as a human, we end up looking at times for the right things, We look for life, we look for purpose, we look for meaning, we look for hope, we look for eternal life, we look for something that's bigger than what this life can bring. Those are good things that we look for. But we end up looking for good things in bad places. We end up looking for the right stuff in the wrong venues. That's why the angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why'd you come to a tomb? He told you he was going to be alive. Why do you come to the tomb to look for him? And sometimes we do the same thing. We go on this journey of doubt and despair and confusion, and we look for hope, but we're looking to the wrong places for that hope, and we go on this road that turns into a detour of doubt and despair, and that is who I want to introduce you to now. Go to verse 13 of Luke chapter 24. The same day as the resurrection, there are two weary travelers. I wonder if you're a weary traveler. Life just got you beaten down. If so, you're going to be able to relate with my friends. I'm going to introduce you to now in Luke chapter 24, verse 13. And from it, I'll show you the first thing Jesus reaches through. Here it is. Verse 13 says, that very day, the day of the resurrection, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation you're holding with each other as you walk? Just pause for a second. 
can you picture this? You're talking about Jesus, and Jesus walks up to you, but you don't recognize this Jesus and says, what y'all talking about? That's where we're at in this story, in all their despair and all their confusion. And it says, and they stood still, looking sad. Verse 18, then one of them named Cleopas, it's the only one we learned their name, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? <laughs> and they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was, boy, they got that wrong, didn't they? A man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered, there's that word again, paradidomai, handed over him to be condemned to death and crucified him. We'll stop there for a moment. So I want to tell you this, Jesus, number one, reaches through doubt. Jesus reaches through doubt. They're on this journey. They're going the wrong direction. The Holy Spirit was going to come and launch the church there in Jerusalem, but because they had doubts, because this Jesus that was supposed to live has now died, they're going on this seven-mile journey. So y'all strap your shoes on. Let's go on a walk with Cleopas and the companion. But here's what I want you to see about their doubt. They're on this journey of doubt and despair, and they're going to nowhere. What we know about where they're headed here in Emmaus is that we don't even know today on the map exactly where Emmaus is. We have guesses, but it's this seemingly insignificant place, and these are two seemingly insignificant people, one of which we don't even know their name. I love that God didn't put their name in the Bible. You know why I love it? Because it reminds people like me when I feel insignificant and I feel nameless that that's the kind of people God wants to reach the most. Jesus shows up and he walks. I love verse 15 where it says he drew near to them, but he didn't just draw near and be like, get out of the way like you thought I did to my sweet little daughter. No, he draws near to them and it says he walks with them. When we have doubts, this is what we learn about Jesus. Jesus doesn't walk away. He walks along. Jesus doesn't kick us and say, leave me alone, go away. He doesn't walk away from your doubts. He leans into them. He walks beside you in them. And in fact, I want to invite you. We're kicking off a new series next Sunday. Y'all should come. It's going to be called Deconstructing Doubt. And what we're doing is we're looking at the fact that we believe the church should be the safest place on the planet for people like you and me to wrestle with our hard questions about faith, theology, God, to wrestle with our doubts and our confusions. And so we're going to look at how people had doubts in the Bible, and Jesus met them in their doubts. So you're invited. We do this every week, just so you know. <laughs> this isn't just Easter. We're here next Sunday, and we'll be here every Sunday after that, and we'd love to have you on the journey. But right now, we're on this journey with Cleopas and his companion. Insignificant people go into an insignificant place. So let me ask you, if you're Jesus, because listen, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, it was the death of death. He conquered everything. On the day that you gave death a TKO, <laughs> what would you do? Well, if Jesus had PR people, they would be saying, find the biggest microphone, find the most significant locations, and find the most significant people, and make sure you share that story. Because Jesus is going on this journey where he's got 40 days to be the resurrected Savior, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, who conquered death, hell, and the grave. And what does he do but go to this road to an insignificant place, walking with seemingly insignificant people? That's what my God does. And that's what he's doing in your heart today. I prayed for you. Do you know that? I'll tell y'all something. I know you're like, we just met. But I've prayed for you all year. Our staff, our church leadership, we've prayed for you. We've prayed for God to meet people on a detour road this Easter in all these services that we've had. It's why we've had all these services so that we could make sure we did everything we can to introduce people to a God. Listen, here it is. A God who holds all power, who is also personal. Did you know that? The God who holds all power is also personal. I've had so many times in my life where I doubted myself. You ever doubt yourself? Just look in the mirror. I'm the hardest person I've ever led. How about you? I've doubted me. I've doubted God. I went on a journey in my teen years, or my earthly father, who was a pastor. I always said, we, you may not know my story. I always said, I'd never be a pastor. <laughs> be careful with your nevers, because here I am. And I was the shy kid. I couldn't talk in front of people. None of that kind of stuff. And God called me to preach. 
I, all I am, all I can tell you is I'm just a testimony of the fact that God doesn't call people because they're equipped, but he equips them when he calls them, because this ain't me. Any of this stuff you see, man, I'm just so glad God can do something with a knucklehead like me. But I mean, I doubted myself. I doubted God. I doubted. I went and studied other religions. And my dad, I'll never forget, my earthly father said, well, I'll buy you the books to help you study the other religions under one condition. You just tell me what God's showing you. And I was like, all right. And you know, the more I dug, you know what I found? Jesus. Actually, let me rephrase that. You know what happened? He found me. He reached out to me. And I still remember a time I was, man, I was so depressed. I didn't have kids yet, thank God. I wasn't ready. I was 21 years old. I was working some five different roles and jobs. And Jessica and I had been married just a little while. And I had shingles pop up on my right eye, swelled my eye shut. And man, I was for 60 days on my back. And God used that moment to speak into my heart. But I'm so hard-headed, it took 60 days. How many other hard-headed people in the room? All right, all five of us that are honest in the room. <laughs> but I remember my earthly father coming to sit with me one time. I was so depressed. I had every doubt imaginable about God. And man, I sure had every doubt about me. I said, God, why would you call somebody like me? I was, man, I was at the point of where I was just wanting to take my own life. And my dad came and bought a pizza, and I didn't eat any of it. But he sat there, and you know what he didn't do? He didn't preach at me. He was personal. And because my earthly father sat with me, you're waiting for the big punchline, he said? There wasn't one. The punchline is that he was there. And my earthly father reminded me that I have a heavenly father who loves me even more. And he met me in all of my doubts and all of my despairs in that moment, and he's done it ever since. And he wants to meet you in yours today. The way I was doing the work of God in my life, because I was, I looked like I had it all together. Y'all got a church smile? Y'all know what those are? Some of y'all are new here. We talk about the church smile. It's a smile. You have a knockdown, drag out fight in the parking lot, in the car. You're trying to get the kids there. And like, you really did want to kick one of them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But then as soon as you step out of the car, hey, brother and sister, how you doing? <laughs> on the inside, I'm falling apart and probably cussing somebody. But on the outside, I'm smiling and looking like I got my church face on. Y'all, y'all with me? Don't act like it's just me. I know it's you too. <laughs> church smile. Sometimes, even when we have a church smile on the outside, we look like we got it all together on the inside. We're falling apart. That's the kind of person God, is, God loves to meet where you are. But their eyes, verse 16, were kept from recognizing him. I wonder, and here's a question for you. What is Satan using in your life? What is it that is keeping you from seeing the work and the presence of God around your life? Spoiler alert. At the end of the story, they do find out it's Jesus. And they recognize the fact that like, wow, that was Jesus there the whole time. And for you, I have prayed for you. Yes, you. That you would look back at your seven mile journey or your 89 million mile journey, it may feel like, to be to where you're at today and that you would go, wow. Jesus was there through every step. I just couldn't see it. So will you look today? Will you let him meet you where you are? I love the Bible. I love this next part where they start talking to Jesus, telling him about what's going on. Some people say the Bible's boring. To people that say the Bible's boring, I think you're boring. <laughs> and you should read it. Now that I've insulted you, let me tell you why I feel that way. <laughs> Verses 17 through 20 there, Think about this. I love the humor and the humanity of the Bible. They start telling Jesus about Jesus. I don't care who you are. That's just funny. Can you imagine it? Can you put yourself in those shoes? They're talking to the great I am, the one who has just conquered death, the king of the universe, and they're talking to this great I am, and they begin the conversation with, well, he was. Boy, they got that wrong. He was. And I'm telling you, you may look at, well, God was something, but he's going to show you today he's still the great I am, even as he meets you in your doubt. But he doesn't just stop there. He reaches through doubt. He also reaches through despair that he brings through. Let's continue. Verse 21 says, but we had hoped. Pause. But we had hoped. Man, that's a sermon in and of itself. You have any had hoped moments in your journey? 
You had hoped you'd be in a different place in this season of your life. You had hoped that your marriage would have lasted. You had hoped that that relationship could have been mended. You had hoped that that diagnosis would have gone away. You had hoped that the cancer wouldn't have taken that person. You had hoped, I could keep going, but are y'all with me here? You have had hoped moments, I do too. Had hope. You had hope. This is where they are. We had hope that he was, there it is again, the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all of this, it's now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. Verse 25, and he said to them, this is Jesus talking now, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning who? Himself. Did you know Jesus is the theme of every book of the Bible? There's one theme of scripture and his name is Jesus and his resurrection is the glue that holds it all together. Oh, to be a fly on the wall to hear how Jesus described all that in this moment. But yet they still ended up stuck. Go to verse 28. It says, so they drew near to the village they were going. That's Emmaus. He acted as if he were going to go further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us. For it's toward evening, and the night is now far spent. So what did Jesus do? He kicked them and said, go away. Get away from me. No. Nope. In the same way, it says he went in to stay with them. Are you glad you serve a God who stays with you even when you end up at dead end places in your life? So here's what's happened. Their doubt has led to depression. Their depression has led to discouragement. And their discouragement has led them on a detour. You ever go on detours? And now their detours have now led them to a dead end. And it reminds us of the second thing Jesus reaches through. He reaches through doubt. But he also reaches through despair. Number two, he reaches through despair. I wonder what you had hoped for that brings despair and agony into your life. They quit and walked away. You know what I've learned about me and humanity? We quit too quick sometimes. Sometimes we stop on the first mile and quit. When, man, if we just keep walking to get to that second mile, God's got a new thing he wants to do in us. And that doesn't mean everything gets easy, but he walks with us. He walks along, not away. And as he does, he reaches through our despair. So I want to challenge you, because that is true today, don't miss what can be because you are stuck in what was. Our God is a what's next kind of God. Our God is the God of next steps. That's why here at Midway, we're launching today. Our Midway family knows this phrase, a discipleship pathway. And what it is, is it's a journey you go on to encounter Jesus, live like Jesus, and ultimately lead like Jesus. And we've shot videos, and we've worked hard on it for over a year. Why? Because we know we serve a God of next steps. And by the way, that's live on the website right now. It's free. Anybody can jump in on it. Midwaychurch.com. There's a button that says Discipleship Pathway. You can start it right now. Maybe that's a good next step. So here's the thing. Some of you are stuck. They went on this dead-end journey, and that's what sin will do. Did you know what sin will do? It'll make you go further than you ever intended to go. It'll make you pay a price you never intended to pay, and it'll make you stay a lot longer than you ever intended to stay. And you end up stuck. Stuck. Some of you are stuck in your faith. You've known Jesus perhaps for a long time, but what was has kept you from what can be and what God desires to do. The new God wants to do through you is just on the other side of your next step of trust and faith in him. Jesus reaches through that despair. Resurrection helps me look at today's problems through tomorrow's perspective because I know the end of the story. Jesus wins. In fact, Jesus already won. And because Jesus lives and because Jesus won, I get to be on the winning team. And when I know the end of the story, it changes how I walk through the pages of the story today, even when it is filled with despair. Jesus reaches through doubt. Jesus reaches through despair. Let's keep reading. And I got to tell you, verses 30 and onward, they're my favorite verses. So let's dig in. Verse 30, what lengths would this Jesus go to reach 
Let's find out. It says, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Circle that word, gave. Verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They did a U-turn. Maybe today's a U-turn moment for you. And they found the 11, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, <laughs> how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Jesus reaches, he reaches through doubt and despair. What links would Jesus go to to reach you? Number three, Jesus reaches even through death. Romans 3, 23 tells us, we talked about sin, and we all fall short. How many of you have kids or grandkids or somebody? How many of you had to teach them to be little sinners? <laughs> Came pretty natural. Guess what, it did for you too. You actually probably did teach them to be little sinners, you just didn't even know it because you were living it out. We have, Romans three twenty three. we have all, you know how many, what the word all means in the original language? It's deep, all means you too and me too. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's God's perfect standard. Sin is missing the mark, literally is what it means. It means God's standard is here and I'm here. Isaiah calls it this way. He says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Romans 6, 23 then tells us the wages of sin, the consequences of sin, the cost of sin is death. So we're out of luck, friends, if that's the end of the story. But God reaches through death to bring resurrection and life to that which is dead. Ephesians chapter two is the part that says we're saved by grace through faith. Before that, it says we are dead in our transgressions, in our sins. But God, who is rich in mercy, what did he do? He sent forth his son because he loves you that much. He reaches even through death. To our story, verse 30, he says he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. You remember our word paradidomai? Even that word gave comes from the same roots. It's the same kind of language as paradidomai, gave. It's handed over. He handed over the bread. Here's that word again, handed over. I want to take you back there because this word has a lot of meaning in and throughout the gospel story of how Jesus journeyed to the cross, how Jesus went from his ministry to the cross. Let me show you four ways that that word is used in the gospels. The first one is Judas. Judas handed over, paradidomai, Judas handed over Jesus to the chief priest. Mark 14, 10, it says that he betrays him. The word betrays, that's paradidomai, same exact word, handed him over. Then the chief priest handed over, paradidomai, handed over Jesus to Pilate. That's Mark 15 and verse 1. This word is translated delivered. They delivered him over. Remember that from verse 20 and verse 7? Same word. Then again, delivered in Mark 15, 15, Pilate then handed over, delivered Jesus, handed him over to be crucified to the will of the people as they said, crucify him. He said, well, I don't find fault, but if that's what you want, here it is. And prophecies were fulfilled in this handing over, but here's the one I want to zoom in on. John 19, verse 30. John was there at the cross while Jesus hung there. In John 19, 30, we see Jesus handed over, paradid by same word, his spirit. Let's look at that verse together. Three things happen in this verse. He received the sour wine. Then, number one, he said, it is finished. It looks like a cry of defeat, but it's actually tetelestai. It's a word that would get stamped on legal documents in antiquity to say, paid in full. It's completed, it's done. So it looks like a cry of defeat that he couldn't accomplish his purpose, but it's actually Jesus saying, I've done what God sent me to do. It is finished. Oh, but it gets better. And then he bowed his head. And it looks like he bowed his head to say, I've lost. Hell has won. 
But no, this word bowed comes from the same word that Jesus used earlier in his ministry where he says, hey, foxes have their holes, birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man himself, the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head, lay his head, it's a place of rest. So what Jesus did when he bowed his head, as John describes this moment, Jesus took this place of violence and he made it a place of rest. Jesus took this brutal place of the cross and he said, I'm going to rest now because to tell us die, it is finished. And that ain't even my favorite part. Let's go to this third one. Then he gave up his spirit. What do you think that word is? Paradidomi. He handed over his spirit. Why are you telling me all this, pastor? I'm glad you asked. Here's the reason. Nobody took Jesus' life from him. He handed it over. He gave it freely because he loves you this much. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but he loves you so much that he would hand over his life. It looked like it was in the hands of Pilate. It looked like his life was in the hands of Judas. It looked like his hands were, his life was in the hands of Herod. It looked like that Satan held in his hands the life of the Son of God. But the whole time, Jesus had it in hand. And he said, I'm going to take it right back up after three days. And I'm King of kings. And I'm Lord of lords. I handed over my life for those who couldn't do for themselves what I can do for them. And he resurrected and he lives. And because he lives, because he handed over his life, I can have life and have it to the fullest. That's my king. That's my Jesus. Here's how he said it. John 10, 18, Jesus said, hey, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily <laughs> for I have authority to lay it down when I want and also to take it up again. So my friends, what looked like a removal of his life was actually him reaching for your life. What looked like an end was actually a beginning. What looked like defeat was actually victory. And today what looks like despair, what looks like doubt, what looks like death, God is ready through his resurrection to breathe life into your heart today. Will you receive it? He's ready to meet you in all of those things. Back to our story. Verse 30, he broke the bread and he gave it. He gave it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave the bread. And as he did, I love what happens next. Verse 31 says, their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. And you know their minds did something like this. Wow. All seven miles of my doubt, all seven miles of my despair, all seven miles of this walk of what felt like death to me, Jesus was there the whole time. I'm praying over you today that you can see that Jesus on your whole journey has been there every single step of the way. They say our hearts burned within us. Didn't our hearts just burn within us? And they're not talking about indigestion. <laughs> Maybe your heart's burning right now. It ain't indigestion. It's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart, just like they felt. And I want to show you today, friends, that Jesus handed over his life. He said, I stretch out my hands. This is my reach. I love you this much as his hands were nailed to the cross. Later, Thomas would hear that Jesus appeared to the disciples, but he wasn't there. And he said, how many doubting Thomas is in the room? I'm one of them. Yeah, I would have been Thomas. He said, well, unless I see the scars on his hand, I'm not going to believe. What did Jesus do? Get out of the way, Thomas. No. He shows up for Thomas and says, hey, look right here. By the way, you ever wondered, why did Jesus keep his scars? I mean, if I just defeated death, I'd get rid of them. I'm like, I ain't looking at that mess. Hmm. Jesus kept his scars to remind people like Thomas, to meet people like Thomas where they are, and to remind us that God brings beauty from ashes, that God brings triumph through all of our trouble, that God takes what the enemy meant for evil and he uses it for good. And he meets Thomas where he is. He reaches him, just like he stretched out his arms this way. He reaches to Thomas. And then you know what he does for these two? He reaches out. I always wonder, verse 35, it says, he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. I wonder, what did they see then that they didn't see before? They had walked seven miles with Jesus. What did they see? 
Scripture doesn't explicitly say, but I would imagine it goes something like this. Jesus took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. I wonder if they saw the scars. And in the moment they saw the scars, they saw the reach of a living Savior, and they knew, that's my Jesus. So today, what is it that you need to hand it over That's the invitation today. Jesus handed over his life for you. He went to Satan and said, give me the keys that you think you own to death, hell, and the grave. He said, hand them over. This is my resurrection, my kingdom. I'm gonna build my church, and even the gates of hell can't prevail against it. So this is the invitation for you. Just as Jesus modeled for you, handing over his life. He said to you today, hand it over. All your guilt, all your shame, all your excuses, all your sin, hand over your life. Salvation comes from surrender. For the next several moments, I'm gonna ask nobody to move, just to be totally still and be honest with God. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I'm gonna give you a moment. We're gonna have a prayer time for several of you. I just wanna pray over you in this moment. I wanna ask you today, why would you keep carrying what Jesus already carried to the cross for you? As you reach for him like that little child, He'll reach right down to where you are at. I want to talk to several groups of people, but first, how many of you would say today, I just know that I know that I know that I'm a believer. I'm totally sure that if I died today, I'd spend eternity with God in heaven because of my relationship with Jesus. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Just say, I already know. Some of you can't raise your hand, and that's okay. I'm going to talk to you in just a moment. You can put your hands down. Thank you. I praise God for that assurance. Now I want to talk to three groups of people. The first of which is this. You're saved. But you would say in this very moment, I'm stuck. I'm being kept from next steps because I'm stuck in what was. I I feel stuck in my sin. I feel stuck in something. If that's you right now, I want to ask you, would you just lift your hand as Jesus was bold? You'd be bold enough to say, that's me. I feel stuck right now. I see you all over the house. And God sees you if I can't see you. If you're online, you lift your hand too. You can put your hands down. Here's what I ask you in a moment. I'm going to have a special prayer time. This platform here is made of wood, and it's just that. It's just a hunk of wood, but we're going to make this place an altar, and I'm going to pray over you in just a moment. When I pray in a few moments, this first group now that has raised your hand, you feel stuck, I want to ask you as believers to be the first to step out and come stand here. There'll be a lot of people here, and I just want to pray over you. Second group of people, you're saved. You, You say, I know I've given my life to Christ, but I need to be baptized. I saw this sweet young lady that's sitting on the front row right now. I saw her example, and I need to take that step because Jesus did that and asked me to do that. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Say, I just know I need to be baptized. It's time. I see you. I see you. I see all of you. And God does too. I see you. I'm going to ask you in just a few moments. I'll pray and count to three. When I say three, I want you to join all those that are coming here. All I'm going to do is pray for you and give you some next steps. You can put your hands down. Last but certainly not least, how many of you would say today, I just couldn't raise my hand at the beginning? I just couldn't say that I know for sure that I've given my heart and life to Christ, that I've surrendered all, that if I died today, I'd be with him forever because of my relationship with Jesus. So pastor, will you pray for me? I would like to be sure. If that's you, would you lift your your hand right now? Just say, pray for me. I see you. I see you. God sees you. I praise God. I want to ask you that lifted your hand to come and join those in just a moment as well. I'm going to pray for you right now. We're going to stand our feet across the building. Will you all stand to your feet? across the whole building, I'm gonna pray, and then I'm gonna count to three. And all of you in those last three groups there, I wanna ask you to come and just stand here and let me to pray over you. God, I thank you. I pray for boldness over these that have lifted their hand. And Lord, as they begin to come in just a moment, I pray it would be a life-giving moment of next steps in their life. We love you, Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Ready? One, two, three. Just begin coming. All three groups. You're stuck in something. You need to be baptized. You're not sure about salvation. Just come. Fill up this area. There'll be a lot of people here. Y'all come. Y'all give them some encouragement as they come. Jesus was bold. You can stand. You can kneel. But come and let's fill this altar area up here. We're going to make it an altar. You guys keep coming. Even from the back. I'll wait on you. Y'all keep giving them some encouragement. They're stepping out today. They're being bold today. I see you. I see you. And you're kneeling, so I'm going to kneel with you over here today. You don't have to. You can stand. Y'all, come on down. We're going to fill it up over here. You're stuck in something. i got to take that next step, or I need to know about how to be saved. I'm going to kneel with you because we're all in this together, my friends. And I want to pray over you right now. Some of you are stuck. Y'all keep coming. Y'all keep coming. You're welcome to come at any point. I'm just going to pray over you. 
God, I wanna pray over those who feel stuck in something right now. God, in the powerful, matchless name above every name, in the name of Jesus today, I declare there's gonna be chains that are gonna fall. God, you're gonna tear down walls. That which the enemy has used for good, the lies of Satan that have been poured over these dear souls. God, you're gonna breathe truth and life into what has felt like death in their life. I know it, it's who you are. And so God, whatever they brought here as we lay it down together, I lift these, my friends up, my brothers and my sisters. Whatever makes them feel stuck, God, I pray, won't you meet them there in this moment? And as we continue to pray and lift up all of these steps, how many of you would say, I came down because I just know I need to be baptized? Would you just look up at me for a second if that was you? I see you guys, I see you, I see you. Oh man, all across the whole place here, I see you, I see you. God, I thank you for those who said today's that day for me where I need to just say, yes, Jesus, I'm saved, but I need to be baptized. Uh, give them the boldness that Jesus displayed as he went to the cross and stood for truth, God. Thank you that you're gonna meet them in that amazing step. I can't wait to celebrate their baptism, whether it's here or elsewhere, God. Thank you for that example. May we follow in it. And last but not least, some of you said, I just don't know that if I died today, I'd spend eternity with God in heaven. If that's you, would you just look up at me for a second? I wanna see you, I see you, I see you. Who else? I see you, ma'am. God bless you. And even if you didn't look up and see me, I, I see who I can and God sees everybody. Even if you didn't come forward, but you know you should have, God sees you. And I wanna lead you in a prayer. Listen, a prayer doesn't save you. I can't do anything for you, but Jesus already did everything for you. So if you're ready to trust in him, to hand over your life to him, pray something like this. It's not about the prayers, it's about your heart saying, Jesus, here I am. Pray something like this. Say, Jesus, today I give you me. I know you died for me. I know you rose from the dead. Will you forgive me? Will you save me? Thank you, Jesus, for reaching me. And my friend, the heavens are rejoicing right now. If you just prayed that prayer, it is finished. To tell us, die, paid in full. Jesus has accomplished what you can, and you can walk in that now. All things are made new, and in just a moment, we're gonna celebrate, just like the heavens are roaring right now, we're gonna roar, but I wanna pray over you now and give you some next steps. God, thank you for all of these steps. Embolden us, Lord, as we begin to move from our knees to stand to our feet, may we stand on the firm foundation of Jesus and his resurrection, and every next step today, whatever it is, I pray we'd walk on that journey together, and all God's people said, Amen. My friends, will you stand to your feet, but don't leave just yet. There are cards here. If you came forward for any reason, I wanna ask you, will you just grab one of these cards? We've spread them all out. Would you all just pass them around? Make sure everybody, if you came forward, grab one of these cards. And here's what I wanna challenge you to do. Take that card. And as you go back to your seat, we're gonna celebrate you, we're gonna cheer, whatever it is, fill it out. And there are people to my left and your right as you leave. Will you turn that in at one of those desks as you leave so we can go on this journey together. Y'all thank Jesus for what he's doing in these people's lives as they go to their seats, prepare to take their next steps. Let's thank God for what he's doing. The heavens rejoice, that's weak, let's do it louder. Come on, let's give God some praise, woo! God is good, God is good. And my friends, we can celebrate it. people said amen thank you for being here happy easter smile as you leave follow the direction of our amazing parking folks and they'll get you out of here safely and then come back next week he is risen god bless you guys you're dismissed